This morning I'd like to read to you from Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We are to pray in the name of Jesus. We are to give thanks in the name of Jesus. We are to ask all things in the name of Jesus. And by him, the Father is glorified. I want you, or I encourage you, to take a look at what that actually means. What does it look like? Often we read these things and we think we know what they mean, but as you take a closer look, as we are uh, reminded afresh by the hermeneutic study, that there's more to it, there's more layers, and it's a lot more powerful than you might think. So let's uh, turn to number 102. And as we think about and meditate on what the name of Jesus means and how it's used to glorify God, let's think about it. There's something about that name. Please stand with me. Let's sing number 102. Let's sing it through twice, please. <laughs>
112. Jesus, name above all names. Twice. <clears throat> Thank you. 
to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. that are on vacation and not here today. <laughs> Is Al out there? Uh, just Lauren right now. Just Lauren. Bossy. He's probably, uh, um, let me, I just want to pause. Al was trying to get in. Let me see where he is here. I'm not sure if that was because either he was okay. there or he wasn't. Oh. Um, well, Justin was telling me what we're experiencing in our house, they're experiencing it there. CenturyLink is just all over the map, usually down. Supply issue. Supply yeah. issue. So let me just drop Al a quick text. They are in Jackson, Mississippi right now, traveling back. So today, we are going to wrap up the book of Daniel. Um, no. No, no, we're not. Uh, we're going to take a, a piece of it that I hope brings great comfort to your hearts. So today we're going to continue our study in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Daniel's uh, Bible prophecy is future fact. It's presented within a wrapper of historical fact, making the future fact undeniably trustworthy. That's to me, as I, as I try and find words to express this whole thing, it's, uh, it's difficult. Okay, uh, he says he didn't get the link. I just texted it to him. 
Oh, you did. Super. Thank you. I'll just stay offline. Uh, since uh, now that it, since Jose, are you in communication with them? Then I'm just yeah. going to step out of it. Okay. okay. So it's all yours. Um, so it's what I'm saying is that we can we can trust what's ahead, just like Daniel did, because he's already seen some fulfilled prophecy to tell him that God is true to his word and you can trust his word. Um, we're going to rely heavily on our previous work of this great book, particularly chapter 7, um, as we go back and we're going to use chapters 2 and chapters 4 to properly interpret what we see in chapter 7. So we'll take a, a holistic approach to the book of Daniel here. Remember that when Daniel left those unwinged lions in chapter 6, he doesn't write what happened next in the life of Babylon. What he does instead in chapter 7 is transport us back to the first year of the reign of King Belshazzar. How many years did Belshazzar rule? Three. Three. Excellent, Greg. Thank you. Three. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think in one of the most intense dream visions in the Bible, Daniel uses what we see in chapter 7 to describe visions that really greatly troubled him. They really did. Uh, so it is with a lot of prayer that we move forward into this portion of this book that shook Daniel to his inner soul. I believe there are, there are some passages, Deuteronomy chapters 28 to 30, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, that set up the whole um, interpretation, the whole view that we have of the book of uh, in the New Testament like Revelation like for, uh, Second Thessalonians and other books so Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1 let's just read from there uh, in the first year of Belshazzar king of Babylon Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed and then he wrote down the dreams telling us the main facts Daniel spoke saying I saw in my vision by night and behold the four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now at this point, let me just ask you if you would consider this a nightmare or just another dream. This guy had a quite a vision, didn't he? The first one's like a lion and it had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, Thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceeding strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And we will pick up our in-depth analysis of this particular chapter in verse 4, but a quick review of what we saw in verses 1 and 1 to 3 last week. First of all, Daniel 7, 1 tells us that Daniel had multiple visions. Uh, I believe the first three beasts are given in the first vision, the second vision concerned the fourth beast only, and the third vision is a scene in heaven. So we're working our way through these in this chapter. Daniel 7, 2 tells us that Daniel saw the winds of the heavens stirring up the great sea. And I believe the winds of the heavens represent the heavenly powers and the forces that God uses to set the nations of the world, particularly the Gentile nations, in motion. When you study this book, you must come to the conclusion that God is orchestrating the way the world goes. Not the sin part, I'm not saying that at all. But he's using Gentile kingdoms without their knowledge, consent, or anything to bring his own will about. Isn't that, isn't that uh, incredible? Uh, showing God's sovereignty. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar signed up to lead the uh, Babylonian Empire, or he took it by force... Uh, did he even have an inkling in those days that God was going to use him for his will and not Nebuchadnezzar's? No, I don't. How about Belshazzar? How about uh, Darius? How about all those guys? No. 
We see this wind here from God in the form of war and strife. That's what it normally stands for, stirring up the water of the great sea. We saw that God uses water in the Bible, particularly in Bible prophecy, to represent people, nations, and tongues. That's what the water represents. So we often use the expression, a sea of humanity. Have you ever heard that uh, expression? Yeah, that's, this is where it's from. Uh, and the Bible often refers to seas as massive masses of people. So when Daniel talks about the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, he's telling us that God is moving over a people who are in great numbers from many nations who speak multiple languages by using heavenly powers and forces to set the nations of the world in motion to fulfill his plan for mankind. That's what that phrase means. In a, in a simple sentence, it means God is in control. That's what we're seeing here. So this people are not the Jews. We know that because of, their, because of the description, the many nations, multiple tongues, etc., etc. This is the Gentile world. God is moving over the Gentile world. Uh, like the Babylonian kingdom, that would become the Medo-Persian kingdom, that would become the Greek kingdom, that would become the Roman kingdom. There's a progression here as we go through. In other words, as I said, he is dealing with the Gentile world. That's what verse 2 is telling us. That's what the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea mean. He's dealing with the Gentile world. And he's going to use them without their permission, without their consent, or even their knowledge to set up his own coming kingdom, which we will be seeing toward the end of Daniel chapter 7. It's an awesome study. The sea provides the background for what came out of it. Uh, Daniel 7.3, that tells us that Daniel saw four great beasts rising out of the water. And out of these well, these turbulent waters, which is the Gentile world, isn't it? Uh, is the Gentile world ever at peace with anybody? Oh my. Even themselves? I don't think so. But out of this turbulent waters, this turbulent sea, Daniel saw four of the ugliest zoo animals you can imagine rise up out of this. I believe this occurred one at a time in the sequence that he laid out uh, in the following verses. They came one at a time. Uh, the reason that that's true, I believe, is because the kingdoms came one at a time. Uh, each beast represents a chronology of the kingdoms of the world. Exactly as it was in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2. So in the king's viewpoint, uh, they were the, the, when he saw this in Daniel chapter 2, they were the physical parts of a human being. The head was gold, which represented? Nebuchadnezzar. Yep, which is the kingdom of? Babylon. Babylon. The arms and breastplate were silver. That represented who? Medo-Persians. Medo right. And the belly of brass represented? Alexander Greece. Yes, Greece. And the things of iron represented? Romans. Romans. Yes. So now that dream is transported into chapter 7, but there's more meat on the bone here. From God's viewpoint, they were... Bestial. They, their true character was revealed. They were seen as these beasts because the Gentile world is what it is. It is what it is. Donnie, did you finally get him to go to sleep back there? He's got the sweetest, just the sweetest noise, right? Uh, each was unique and different uh, in their own way, but they were all great. They all had that in common. And these beasts represent kings and kingdoms, specifically Gentile kings and kingdoms. And as if you guys have already listed them, that's what they were. Even today, did you notice that most uh, nations have their own animal symbols? Did you notice that? What is ours? The eagle. The eagle, right. We use the eagle. These Gentile kings and, and kingdoms, Daniel saw, represented uh, four different kinds of beasts here. We see the lion, the bear, the panther, or the leopard and the beast with ten horns. Uh, interestingly, Daniel 4.32 tells us that God turned Nebuchadnezzar into a beast. Why did he do that? Why did he turn Nebuchadnezzar into a beast? What's that? Because of his pride. Yes. To show him who's who. To show him who's who. You're both correct. Because of his pride, God had to show him who is who to teach him that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. That's why Nebuchadnezzar was made into a beast. So as you discuss today's message, what is our goal? My goal is really single-fold. I'd like you to focus on that thought, that the Most High 
rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. You must walk away from Daniel 7 with that in your heads and in your hearts. God is in control. He has the most high rules in the affairs of men and he gives it to whomsoever he wills. Yes. True statement? All true. True statement. We must never forget that God is in charge, not the enemy. Sometimes we do. As I look at the political atmosphere, even of our own country, it causes me to have great concern for the, for the future. So our generation is going to check out of here pretty soon. But then we've got our kids and our grandkids, and should the Lord tarry, our great-grandkids. And we have great concern for the environment that they're going to grow up in. Yes. So we spend time praying about the generations to come, um, because I am concerned. But I should never forget that God ultimately is in charge. He's got this. He has got this. Cause for concern for me? Oh yes. Cause for fear? Should not be. Should not be. Now look at Daniel chapter 4. Here's where we'll pick up our, our in-depth study. This is where we left off last week. The first beast was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. There is no doubt in my mind at all that this lion with eagle's wings represents Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar. That's what this beast represents. We can see what God is doing here. As he's giving Daniel this vision, he is revealing future <coughs> prophecy to Daniel by starting at a historical point that Daniel was currently living within, which is the king of Babylon. He is going to move him, remember our algebra analogy? where we move from the known, and then you're able to know, to get to what you don't know and make it all make sense. That's what the Lord is doing with Daniel here. Uh, he's currently living within which kingdom as he's getting this dream? He's, no, you're close though. First year, Belshazzar. Belshazzar. So he is in the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon. Yes. Does he, so this prophecy about this beast coming out of the water, that is something he already knows, because he's lived it. He's been there. So you see how the Lord is working this. He's taking him from something Daniel knows to be true, and now he's going to tell him how this is going to play out. What should that do for Daniel's confidence? I think it should put him on solid ground. It should build it up. The Lord is going to take him now from the known to the unknown. God is then going to move from the known, which is the Babylonian kingdom, to the soon-to-be-known Medo-Persian kingdom. Was Daniel there for any of the Medo-Persian kingdom? Any of it at all? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, he was. When Darius got there, when Cyrus, he was there for that, wasn't he? He was there. Did he see the Israelites return to Israel at the end of their 70-year um, vacation? <laughs> Yes, he did. And he died somewhere thereafter during the Medo-Persian Empire. So the Lord is going to continue to use this teaching technique for him. What about us? How many of those four kingdoms have we seen come and go? All four. Yeah. So what should that do for us? It should increase our confidence. I mean, i got to stand up when I say that. It should increase our confidence because he said four things. And how many of those four things ever came about? Four. All four. Can I sit down now? I have to sit down now. <laughs> but this, this really winds me up. It's like that key in Granny's grandfather clock. I got to run till it runs down. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be okay. So we'll be here for a while today. Okay? Amen, guys. Amen. 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 Thank you. Time, yes. <laughs> yeah, and to what will come after for them. So he's been there in Medo-Persian. Now it's going to go to the Greek Empire. Daniel's going to know it's going to happen because he's been through the first two steps already. And now, and then on to the Roman Empire, uh, just like our algebra analogy. And we're going to use that same approach. Uh, but we're going to have a different starting point than Daniel as we move through what was prophetic in his day, but to us is history. We're going to start later on down the road. You know what that tells me, guys? We were born in a very good time. Weren't we? Amen. Yeah. It's like Ezekiel. Ezekiel and Daniel were contemporaries traveling together. 
and they're both doing their writing as they go, probably exchanging books, both looking in each other's books to try and figure out what is going to happen next. We are very blessed and privileged that we can look back and see. We can read both their writings, and we can then see how it was fulfilled. I think it's awesome. What a better time to live in human history than today? I don't know of one. I think this is it. The only time that'd be more fun to live in it is when we're up there, right? <laughs> uh, that's, and that's yet ahead of us. So we already know from history that these four Gentile kingdoms that came out of the sea have come and gone. Uh, so we move into the prophetic part of Daniel's vision with an even more uh, confirmed history than he did. So he was confident we should be all the more confident because we've seen that much more fulfilled. So this should give us great confidence. Remember that Daniel's vision builds on Nebuchadnezzar's vision as recorded in Daniel 2. So we'll take the holistic approach here. In that vision, Daniel 2.32 tells us the head of the image Nebuchadnezzar saw was of fine gold. We see in Daniel 2.38 that God revealed to Daniel who that fine head of gold was. Donnie, don't, Donnie, don't worry about us. I can, out, I can outspeak him. I can. So don't worry about us. I can outspeak him. Um, who, did it, Dan, who did God tell Daniel that head of fine gold was? Who? Yes, sir. Nebuchadnezzar. That's right. Daniel 2.38. So the head was made of gold because Nebuchadnezzar, get this, Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful ruler of the most powerful kingdom in human history. I say that without reservation. The Babylonian kingdom was the most powerful nation with the most powerful ruler in human history. The only time that will change, his spot in number one, is going to be when Christ comes back to the earth and establishes his millennial Thank kingdom. You, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. that will then make the Babylonian kingdom seem like jump change. Okay, so Daniel 2.37 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was the king of kings. Not the king of kings. The, he, Daniel says a king of kings. Big difference. The a king of kings is going to be displaced as by the king of kings when the Lord comes back. So God gave him a kingdom. He gave him power. He gave him strength. And he gave him glory that has not been seen since. Not been seen since. Babylon will keep the title of being the most powerful kingdom in human history until Jesus Christ brings his own kingdom to earth. Uh, the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be more powerful than any kingdom ever seen, and it will never end. Amen. That's the way this lays out. So the head of gold, Babylon, as seen in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, is represented here in Daniel's vision as a lion with eagle's wings. That's how this plays out. So the association of Babylon to a lion shouldn't have surprised Daniel. Uh, he would have seen the correlation in his, in his studies and in his writings as he was looking at, with his contemporary. Who was his contemporary besides Ezekiel? You guys remember what Old Testament prophet? Yes, sir. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah started before Daniel and ended halfway through Daniel's time. But he, all he had to do was go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7, Jeremiah actually refers to Babylon as a lion. And I'll read that to you quick. Jeremiah 4, 7, the lion has come up from its thicket, which is talking about the rise of Babylon, chapter 4. And the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Uh, he has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. And what happened to Jerusalem in Daniel 1, 1? exactly what Jeremiah said in chapter 4, verse 7. Exactly. So, and Jeremiah 50, 17 states that Israel is scattered sheep. The lions have scattered them. Another reference to what happened with Babylon. There's good reason that a lion represents Babylon. How, how many of you young guys know what lions do? Are lions extremely bold or very timid? Uh -huh. Very bold. Hey. Very bold. Thank you, Emma. Uh, they, uh, situations that would crush other animals in fear, don't even shake the smallest hair of a lion. Lions can kill an elephant, did you know that? They can actually kill an elephant, while most animals would prefer to die of hunger rather than attack an elephant. Lions also, are lions, uh, like compared to Babylon, do they intimidate other lion and animals? Oh, yes. or do they roll over? Of course, they're very intimidating. How about them being the skilled hunters, uh, the most skilled maybe on the planet? 
absolutely. Yes, sir. Part of the reason is because they're the only big cat that hunts in like a pack, like a prime. All the other big cats are solitary hunters. Right. These guys know what they're doing, don't they? Very fierce. As I worked through my study on how God uses lions to implement his will, um, uh, I got some input from Dave. He, he pursued that line of thought. We were talking about it a couple weeks ago, and I know he's not there today, but shout out to Dave here. Basically, you could say I subcontracted this part of my study to Dave. So you contractor guys out there know how that works. He pointed out to me that in Leviticus 26, uh, it, that tells us that God warned Israel that, that it, they didn't follow his direction, which piggybacks on what Paul said today in his Joel study. He would send wild beasts to rob them of their children, destroy their cattle, and make them few in number. And this is kind of like a rinse and repeat with Israel, isn't it? But we saw that happen in Daniel 1.1, where God used the winged lion, or Babylon, against Judah to take their children, their possessions, and to kill many. It was all fulfilled there. So Dave's research revealed here that there's no doubt that, that God specifically uses lions to bring judgment against his people when they disobey his direction. Thus the lion of Babylon. Babylon didn't just wasn't allowed to rise just for the sake of rising. God used them to bring Judah back to where he wanted her. That's what happened. So if you or I had this dream today, about a, a winged lion rising up out of the sea. And if I told you guys I had that dream without any other background knowledge at all, what would you think? <laughs> what would you think? Ah, uh, yeah, it's, 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 this guy's weird. Get away from yeah, him. I would say you had too much sugar before bed. Too much sugar before yeah, bed? That causes nightmares. The anchovies were bad on my pizza? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one brick short of a load. Elevator don't go all the way to the top. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of analogies for that. But, it, but Daniel wouldn't have hesitated to tell the guys around him about this dream, which he did at this time. Why would they have said, I get it? Well, two things. First of all, today, in the heap of ruins that was once this great city Babylon, there's a proud lion standing on a pedestal. And guess what it has? Wings. Wings. Yes. As they've excavated Babylon, the symbol Babylon chose to represent themselves was a winged lion. Museums are full of them now. Every shovel turn over there turns up more stuff. Yeah, the winged lion. Uh, even the pagans of Daniel's day would have no problem identifying who Daniel was speaking about. Even the pagans then knew that the winged lion represented Babylon. Yes, sir. <laughs> Dara says, didn't it make it into our cigarette packs on Paul Ball? I don't know. Is that on there too? I think it is. Is it? Yeah, it's a winged lion. The winged lion, no kidding. So it's even in our own culture. Yes, it is. So we're not going to light up after church, guys. No, we're not. No. <laughs> so, but if you run a study that further, that whole idea, go to just in your own time, study Jeremiah chapter 50. It's an excellent one. So the phrase there where it says, oh, what happened to its wings? Plucked off. They were plucked off. What is that telling us? What was that part of the story? Again, remember, we're dealing with history. At this point in this prophecy, even to Daniel, this is history. Was that... What did that represent? I think because of the rest of the description, I believe it refers to the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. You don't remember his mental lapse and he lost his loss of identity when he became a beast. Daniel chapter 4. That's what happened to the king of Babylon, represented by the lion having his wings pulled off. His wings were clipped. Daniel 4.33 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was driven from men. He ate grass. Uh, as an oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. His hair grown like eagle's feathers. Does that make, I mean, the guys like me who have no hair, that even makes me kind of jealous, you know? <laughs> and his nails were like bird's claws. That's what he became. So Nebuchadnezzar accurately depicted Gentile rulers in their pride, as Granny pointed out, in their disregard for God. But what God did to him as Herb pointed out in fixing that issue, was how he deals with any of them and can at any time. 
Okay, so the great Babylonian Gentile king, represented by a lion with eagle's wings, was humbled by God. And this is depicted by having his wings plucked off. So that's what we're seeing here. In Daniel's case, he is still on solid ground, because this has all happened. So he, he can connect the dots. Daniel 4.32 tells us that God humbled Nebuchadnezzar to teach him and us what we're trying to get to today, our main point, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomsoever he will. He's in charge. That's what that wing plucking is all about. God is telling the most powerful king outside of himself that ever ruled on this earth that, hey, compared to me, you're a nothing. You are a nothing. And I'll step in anytime I want and put you back on track. Now, we know that uh, his history uh, and Babylon, why when he returned from, how long, by the way, was he out? You guys remember? Was it seven years? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Why was his kingdom still there when he got back? God said so. Exactly. Because God said so. <laughs> for no other reason. Do you think there was competition for his chair? Oh, yes. For all those guys. Uh, but yeah. Many in Babylon would have had first-hand knowledge of Nebuchadnezzar's, uh, his humiliating experience and would have fully understood what Daniel saw regarding the plucking of the wings. All of the people that puzzle over this are from, in, in our day and age, they just don't have Daniel's experience. Even the pagans of that day, like I say, knew what was going on here. Nobody misinterpreted it in Daniel's day. They all knew what was being referred to. I can't help but think that, that, that Daniel, uh, in his time with Nebuchadnezzar, when you look at the scriptures, forged a relationship with him, a friendship. And to write of the, this embarrassing chapter in Nebuchadnezzar's life, um, where his wings were plucked, I think it probably pained Daniel. But we're seeing here an exact description of what Daniel saw. After this, Daniel saw something significant. This humiliated lion with the plucked wings, what happened to him? He stood his feet like a man. He stood back on his feet like a man. He did. Stood back on his feet like a man. And I believe we see here Nebuchadnezzar's restoration is what we're looking at. He became like a beast and he acted like one, but his mind and body were restored. God put him back on his feet, restored him to what he once was. When he was brought back to sanity, he again walked upon his feet uh, as a man. And again, there would have been eyewitnesses to Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation and his restoral that were still alive at this time uh, of Daniel, who would fully understand what was being written here. They knew what was going on. It's just us who puzzled through some of it because we didn't live at that time. Now we see that this humiliated lion with the plucked wings that stood on his feet got what? What's that? A man's heart. A man's heart. He was given a man's heart. So this beast was given a, a, a man's mind and nature. Nebuchadnezzar was restored to the logical thought processes that he had before. Daniel 4, 32 through 34 tells us that after seven years of living as a beast, Nebuchadnezzar's sanity was restored. He was given it back. So when you look at this picture that we're seeing here, uh, we are seeing the story of Nebuchadnezzar being revealed in the form of this lion. Daniel 4.34a, uh, just the first part of that verse says, At the end of the time, which was his seven years as a beast, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. I believe we see here that Nebuchadnezzar was given a man's heart. It was restored. That's what we're seeing play out here. We see the prophecy. We see it restored. Uh, his heart towards God was changed forever. I think that's an awesome thing. And I believe this refers to Nebuchadnezzar's his conversion. Uh, I think he came to know the living and true God. But he did learn the lesson of Daniel 4.32. He did learn that lesson, uh, which tells us that God humbled Nebuchadnezzar to teach him that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. He learned that lesson. When you look at Daniel 4.34b, on down through, uh, yeah, let's just go down through 30, well, 35. This is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. After his mind was restored, 
He says, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Now, when I read this, I want you to pay attention to pronouns. Okay? Follow me and pay attention to pronouns. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? That's quite a list of pronouns, isn't it? And what are they focused on? God, right? We see here the pronouns my and me, which would have been used before Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation, are replaced with his and him. The old king's heart, what would he have said? Let's read it from his old perspective. My dominion is an everlasting dominion. My kingdom is generation to generation. My will in the army of heaven is done. No one can restrain my hand or say to me, what have you done? That was the old Nebuchadnezzar. When he got his mind back, I tell you, God, there was some real changes in this guy. He turned it over to God. Certainly things, changes happen. Daniel 4.36, at that time my reason, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. He was given his old job back. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I, restored, I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. The humiliation lion, with his wings plucked off, now stood upon its feet, having had his dignity restored by God, and proclaimed the glories of the one and only God. That was the succession of events here. That's what Daniel is telling us. And then in Daniel 4.37, he says, Now I, back to the I, Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't talk about himself here. He praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. So even Nebuchadnezzar would have understood the vision, wouldn't he? The lion, that's got to be me. The wings, that's got to be me. Plucking the wings, that's got to be me. Restored as a man, able to, that's got to be me. Yeah, that was his story. Daniel 4.32 tells us that God humbled Nebuchadnezzar to teach him. And as, it, and as again I say to us, that he, the Most High, rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. And he learned that lesson well. He went to his grave praising God. And we need to learn the same thing. We do. We need to learn the same thing. If I did my job well as we studied this first beast, we saw things in our studies that should cause us to join Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar in their incredible awe for God as he was given insight into God's master plan through Daniel. Uh, like Daniel, I, I think this should cause us to no longer fear what men can do unto us. You know, to me that's one of the great takeaways of the first six chapters of Daniel. That even while Daniel was standing before these kings seemingly without fear, inside, he was very troubled by the visions that he had seen. But he kept all that within. Daniel was an incredible guy. Also, as we move forward with our service to him, we know that it has an eternal impact on, the, on God's kingdom. These are things that we should draw from on this. Does human history tell us that our interpretation of Daniel 7 verses 1 through 4 is correct? Just look at human history. Did all that happen? Babylonian kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, is, 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 yes all, it all does. I believe it actually does. In, in 539 BC, the Babylonian kingdom fell to the Medo-Persian kingdom. And Daniel is going to see this happen. He's going to live through it. And that further confirms the truth of these prophecies to him. Because he's not just going to see the winged lion. Now he's going to see the Medo-Persians, the bear. The beast like a bear. Remember that Daniel's prophecy is future fact. But it is presented within a wrapper of historical fact. So it's based upon solid stuff. And that makes the future fact totally trustworthy. You can trust it. So we looked at nothing more than the facts, really, that are set forth as prophecy in the Word of God at the time of their writing, that are fully substantiated today by world history, primarily regarding the Babylonian kingdom. We know that the lion with the wings represents Babylon, 
Not just because the Bible said so, but that is backed up by the fact that every turn of the shovel in the ruins of Babylon have further reinforced that viewpoint. And also, the people in his day, in Daniel's day, as they would have read the writings of that dream, would have known exactly what he was speaking about. They would not have scratched their heads over that at all. So as we move through our study of the remaining beasts, we're going to see God move us from short-term prophecies in these four kingdoms, because we know they came and went, and they're going to be fulfilled during some during Daniel's time, some right after. But then he will move into future prophecy that is also future to us. So how should we view that future prophecy? Better believe it. Better believe it. Yeah. Trustworthy. Yeah. Trustworthy. Better believe it. Better act like we believe it. We Now we're going to look at um, that, the beast <laughs> that was like the beast like a bear. Um, and it is going to come in and it is going to displace the, um, the winged lion. Look at Daniel 7.5. Did I use the word conclusion a while ago? <laughs> no, we haven't used it. <laughs> Good, because we're not done yet. We still got 45 minutes. <laughs> Maybe an hour. Daniel 7.5, and suddenly another beast, a second beast like a bear, and it raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and thus said, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. The beast like a bear, using our Daniel chapter 2 analogy, Daniel 2.32, corresponds to the breast and arms of silver that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And what kingdom did that breastplate of silver and the arms represent? Remember? Medo-Persians. Medo exactly. That's why two arms. That's why two arms there. You have the Medes and the Persians who came together to displace the golden head. So, yes ma'am? What were the Medes? What were the Medes? They were a whole country in and of themselves, Roma. I can send you a, a good picture of a map to show you that where they were from. They were from the north. Uh, the Medes were, uh, uh, they were conquerors in their own right. And so were the Persians. Okay. Now when they came up against Babylon, that was a big bite to swallow for any bear. But when you put the, they were kind of like a pair of cubs. But when you put them together, oh my goodness. They became very powerful, very powerful. Obviously powerful enough to displace the greatest kingdom that ever was. Which tells us that, what about our own country? I think the United States is extremely powerful. In our last 200 years, nobody has touched us. But it means, too, that it's not always going to be that way. Uh, and when we go, it may not be by a direct confrontation. Just like the, the Medo-Persians took, uh, how did they displace them, by the way? What does history tell us they did? They moved the river that ran under the city. They rerouted the river to an old dry lake bed. And when they did that, the river that ran under the city dropped to about two feet deep. And it was dark, and the Medo-Persians simply walked in under the walls, not over them. All of that foretold by Isaiah. So we'll get to, we might touch on that in just a moment, but that's how they did it. They did not do it by direct confrontation because they weren't as powerful, but they were devious, right? They were devious. Remember that the, there were two arms on the image of Nebuchadnezzar, one representing the Medes and the other the Persians. So Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian formed an alliance to overthrow Babylon. History confirms all of this. I'm not saying anything that didn't actually occur in human history. They were the ones that have eat Babylon, the winged lion, and they displaced it as the next great world kingdom in about 539 BC. So further study on that, you can, you can look into the identity of the bear in Isaiah chapter 13. If, you just, if you're interested in following up on that, go there. So the breastplate and arms were made of silver, so they were not of the same quality as the head of the image. So Daniel tells us in chapter 2, verse 39, that this kingdom, represented by the beast like a bear, would be inferior to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian kingdom. He had the head of gold. This is silver. So there is a step down here. Um, this tells us that the beast like a bear is lower in quality 
than the winged lion and less courageous. Uh, and yet, even being inferior to Babylon in almost every way, the beast like a bear would defeat the great and mighty winged lion Babylon. They would defeat them. And I, we just talked a, a second ago about how they did it. They tricked them. They, they pulled a fast one. In fact, although each kingdom seen in these visions would display its own version of really vicious ruthlessness, when you look at what God said, each succeeding kingdom from Babylon to Rome would display less governing power, less majesty, and a downward spiral typical of any Gentile pagan rule. That's why I think in our own country we are kind of spiraling down uh, because we have let the pagan side take over. So now we're paying the price for that. So this slow, crushing army of the Medo-Persians was well known, and it fits this bear well. They would throw, if you could do it, if you could do a job with, say, 10,000 men, they'd send a million. That's how they did it. They would simply overwhelm and crush their opponents. So that's how they, so this bear-like characteristic, this beast like a bear, uh, was a perfect picture of how the Medo-Persians did business. Now, bears by nature are cunning, they're ferocious, rough, they, they, they're fierce in battle, um, and especially when they're provoked. Granny and I were in, we spent several years in Alaska with our kids, and uh, <coughs> you don't mess with bears. You just don't do it. There's no way to stand against them because of their power. But like the bear, the, the Medo-Persians, they simply overwhelm their opponents with superior size and strength. That's how they did it. So as a, as a reference about bear tactics, if you're interested, there's a great book out there called Alaska Bear Tales. It is not a book of faith. It is a book of fear. But if you're interested in reading about how bears operate in Alaska, it's called Alaska Bear Tales. I guarantee you after you read it, you won't sleep <laughs> for some time to come. That's the kind of fear the Medo-Persians put into their enemies. So why the word behold? Look at the first, or suddenly, uh, at the start of Daniel 7, 5. This is a very interesting word. And suddenly, another beast, or behold, this beast rose up. Well, that is our Aramaic word, aru. Aru. Uh, it's a word that you should know. Aru. It's an interjection. And what it means is, whoa, what just happened? What just happened? It shows astonishment. Uh, it's a, it, it, I believe it refers to the sudden way the Medo-Persians de defeated uh, Babylon. They got in under the gates and all of a sudden they're amongst them. So you got a bunch of Babylonians running around saying, Aru, Aru. Aru. <laughs> what just happened as they're running around? Uh, that's what they said. They used a backdoor tactic to get into the city uh, but that was foretold by Isaiah. Uh, if you'll recall, we established the fact that the Babylonian king Belshazzar, he should have paid more attention to his Bible instead of his bottle, right? And he would have figured these things out. But yeah, but like mostly these, Babylon, these Babylonians, they're running around uh, during their defeat yelling, Aru, Aru, what just happened? What just happened? Next time we meet, I should have said it, right? In conclusion. Next time we meet, uh, we're going to talk about what is meant by the beast like a bear, raising itself up on one side, what the three ribs between its teeth are, and what is meant by devouring much flesh. God has revealed those things. We should also go through uh, looking at, I think, the four-winged, four-headed leopard next week, too, and who, who, who is given dominion over the beast like a bear. One last question. Do you see any consistency in the way the winged lion and the beast like a bear come into power? Do you see a pattern emerging? One thing that stands out to me is that the way that they both came to power caught their opponents totally by surprise. Didn't it? It caught their opponents totally by surprise. Daniel 1.1. How does that verse start? How does the book of Daniel start? Daniel, he says, the Babylonians are at the gate. In Aramaic, what would they be shouting? Aru. Aru, Aru. 
How did this happen? Now we see the Babylonians using the same word when the Medo-Persians were inside their gate. Aru, Aru, how did this happen? Well, that pattern's not going to stop there. I look ahead, I see 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief, thief in the night. And what is everybody going to be yelling at that time? Aru, Aru. Suddenly. Suddenly. How did this happen? How did this happen? Well, God warned Israel several times about what was ahead of them. And he's also warning our world today. The warnings are there. Amen, they are, aren't they? Yes, they are. He said, I'm coming. Should we believe that to be true? Oh, yes. We better believe it to be true. He says in verse 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, for when they say peace and safety, and is that what they're striving for today? Then sudden destruction, sudden destruction, a aru, aru, cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of night, nor of darkness. This should not take us by surprise. When Christ comes again to take his church, to bring his bride to be with him, we should be expecting the visit. Yes. Not yes. caught by surprise. These first two kingdoms were caught by surprise, paid a big price for it. Mm. But God is warning us as well. Today, peace and safety from the infamous virus COVID has become such a desire of the masses of the world that many look to the darkness of sacrificing the rule of law to find their peace and safety. When in fact all they're doing is creating a pit that they're not going to be able to get out of once they let new masters take over the rock that rolls over the hole. Just as in Daniel's day. How can the blind lead the blind? You know they can't. Uh, this can only have one result and that is that they will lead the world into a ditch. And that's what we're seeing today. That's what we're seeing today. So I was so heartened by what happened in the courts this week where at least some of the rules and, uh, and dr draconian uh, leadership of our country was put back in place because it was deemed to be not following the rule of law. That's where we need to be, right? So when the Lord removes Christians from the world, those left behind are going to be running around yelling what? Aru, Aru, which means what? what just happened? What just happened? I'm just saying all that to say this. If you haven't looked to the light of Jesus Christ, don't wait till everybody is running around saying Aru, Aru, and say, I know what happened. <laughs> Where should you be when you say, I know what happened? Heaven. Up in heaven. Come on. Right? Yes. Launch when Christ comes back to take us out of here. Not only will he save your soul if you come to him for forgiveness of your sins. He says in 2 Timothy 1.7 that he'll remove the spirit of fear. He'll remove it and give us the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. Okay? You guys ready? Should we just keep going? Yeah. No? <laughs> I hear one small voice speak, speaking for you all. All right. All right. Any closing thoughts before we go? Uh, I think God is great. Yes, Roma. I'm sorry. Quick question. Yes. Why are the Babylonians the greatest, as opposed to the Romans and the Greeks and the? Oh, why were they the greatest? Why were they the greatest? What? 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 The difference was between them and the rest of the of the. Uh, there was really two things, Roma. Number one was their absolute power. And number two was their ability to govern. Their, what? their ability to govern. That was never matched anywhere. In the succeeding kingdoms, their, their, the Babylonian ability to govern their people was never again matched. That's what it means when the Lord gave him his royalty back, all that stuff. Their kingdom was so well ruled. It was like a, a well-oiled machine. 
Well, to a great extent, that's what the base of it was. But they followed the rules. Maybe it was because of their fear. Because when, you, when you'll notice at the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life, what was he doing? What was he doing when he had all this happen to him? When he stepped out and, uh, and, and got turned into a beast? What was he doing? Defying God. He was defying God, but as he was, as he was there, he was doing nothing. Did you notice that at the start of chapter 4? Everything was running so smoothly. He was sitting back in his kingdom thinking, wow, I can sit back in my chair now and see how this is all going to turn out. That's what he was doing. He was doing nothing because things were running that good. <clears throat> Darius, Cyrus, uh, Alexander, uh, all the Caesars, they never had that opportunity. But Nebuchadnezzar did. He was the greatest out of all of them. And God made him so. Uh, and then God saved his soul. Yeah. What, a, what an awesome thing. Herb. He saved Cyrus' soul too. I think he did. I think he absolutely did. And that's what caused Ezra's book to be written. Ezra chapter 1. At the end of the 70 years, what did Cyrus do? He gave them their freedom. And he said, anybody that gets in your way, let me know. And by the way, here's a letter of recommendation to you so that if you need something along the way, you can just stop and get it and they'll something have to give it. Something will to your house. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's what, you know, future attractions, guys, we're going to do an Old Testament survey to see how all these books fit together. You've got Isaiah about 150 years before Daniel. A lot of the prophecies that Daniel speaks to, Isaiah fed into. Ezekiel is a contemporary they were there at the same time. Daniel was in the palace. Ezekiel was down with the working troops. So you got two different perspectives of the same stuff. Jeremiah started about half his ministry before Daniel's time and went to about the middle of Daniel. A lot of what he said fed right into Daniel. So we'll do a review. Uh, Paul's book of Joel today. Uh, Malachi. They all play parts in this ever-moving puzzle. But it all goes around one thing. The 70 year banishment. Okay, that's a central theme of the Old Testament. So when we do our Old Testament survey, it won't be per from the perspective of knowing the, 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 the nuts and bolts of maybe what's in each of these books, but what we want to walk away from is an understanding about how they all fit together. They are all fitting together to tell a single story that moves on into the New Testament. And you've got to have that down before we would say do a, a thorough study of the book of Revelation so you can see how it all fits together. So an awesome study. Awesome study. Okay, anything else before we go? Uh, it's pretty exciting. It's a, all that really uh, can wind me up again, so maybe we should just go. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Okay, we're going to have two guys close us, as we've been doing lately. Tim, would you close us first uh, with, um, and thanks for the special, it was awesome. Just listening to the words of that song was such a blessing. In the men's meeting, we're going to be going now into the book of um, Colossians, which tells the story of Christ, the fullness of God. So, And then Pastor Briggs, would you close after him? Father, thank you so much that we can freely gather and study and sing and exalt you, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for Terry presenting these, these things to us so we can be reminded how great and how big you are. May we follow you. May we lean on you, Lord, as we go out and do the mission you've called us to do. In Jesus' name. Father, I too echo that. Thank you for you. Thank you for yourself. Thank you for <clears throat> our eternal security that we serve from a position of strength, but not our own, yours. Yes. We give you the praise and the glory, and we thank you for the privilege of being here, discussing these, believing these, and serving you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.